Okay, so chapter 10, Dracula. Obviously you've read the chapter, so we are just going to do a brief over, a brief ca a recap of what happens in this chapter. We've got Dr. S um, Arthur sorry, giving blood to Lucy via transfusion, Dr. Seward um, not protecting Lucy overnight, uh, Dr. Seward then having to donate his blood to Lucy and von Helsing putting garlic all around Lucy's room. So in chapter 10, Dr. Seward becomes the main narrator and will remain the main narrator for the bulk of the rest of the novel. Obviously, we do have other narrators and uh, forms of narration interjecting, but he will remain the main narrator for the, re for the rest of the story. We've got a situation where he is the only man in the household, in the Western household, because remember Arthur has at go off and visit his sick father. And Seward shows what a consummate professional he is and that he can take charge, and that's what he does, takes control of the Western household. Um, he, as we read through, he's clearly very well aware of the psychological ramifications of Mrs. Westerner's conditions. He's also very aware of the ramifications of Lucy's conditions in terms of how they will affect Mrs. Westerner psychologically. So, um, in his letter dated the 6th of September to Arthur, he explains that Lucy's not looking great that Mrs. Weston is extremely anxious um, and that he has informed Lucy that Van Helsing, his mentor, will be coming to stay with him. This is followed by a diary entry on the 7th of September where he talks about um, meeting Van Helsing and what happens. Now, please Remember, Van Helsing is very, he's a typical gentleman, okay? He, although not British, he does in, embody the idea of being a gentleman. He is, and, and one of those things is he's very, very discreet. So whenever he does something, he is always thinking about the ramifications. And he says that all men are mad in some way or the other and in as much as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so deal with God's madmen too. Okay, so it's the idea of not broadcasting the, the, the madness that is going on in the Western household. This is significant because remember, madness was associated, was, was thought of very, very negatively, and some people actually thought it was catchy. So it could have huge um, ramifications for the family and their reputation. He goes on to say that it, because because it's important to be discreet, we you know it's, everything is on a need to know basis. And when Seward says to him, "What do you think's going on?" He says, "I have for myself thoughts at the present. Later, I shall unfold to you." So clearly, Van Helsing knows more than he's saying, but he's choosing not to share his thoughts with Seward. He's clearly following his own advice about being discreet. He's very cautious and wise, and um, he's he really thinks about when to and where to share information. The sentence structure or construct the construct of the sentence um, is also a reminder to us that he is not English, that he is foreign, and that English is not his first language. His intelligence, though, is very, very evident. He's clearly a very knowledgeable, intelligent man. We see the extended metaphor from where he looks at, look, he is good corn. We will make good crop when time comes. And that metaphor extends throughout the paragraph. He also says very wise things like we learn from failure and not success. So this gives the reader the impression of someone who knows what they're talking about. We are more inclined to trust him. We feel that he is a suitable character to, um, that, that, to save Lucy, to save the situation. He also goes on about how he... Well, the, the Stoker goes on about how he is the complete opposite to Dracula in that he is focused on the healing craft. And whereas we know that Dracula is focused on death. So they are polar opposites 
in terms of their focus. Um, Seward describes Lucy's current state by talking about his her, her spiritual pathology. Okay, now please remember, rather than implying, in terms of the word spiritual, rather than implying that this is witchcraft or magic or a spell, spiritual pathology again demonstrates that um, Stoker is on the cutting edge of understanding psychology because this indicated the state of the development of psychology. Uh, they were starting to refer to it as spiritual pathology, the idea that it is um, emotional and spiritual and everything that is not physical. So he's clearly very well aware of where psychology is at the time. And by using terminology that is cutting edge, it demonstrates to the reader he is very knowledgeable. So Lucy is not looking good. Um, she was ghastly, chalkily pale, and the red seemed to have eat, gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones in her face stood out prominently, and her breathing was painful to hear. Again, remember, they keep focusing on her breathing. It's a heavy breathing. What we would now say today is that it sounds like a heavy breathing phone call. Again, the links to the sexuality and the idea of sex and heavy breathing implying that there is exertion during sex. They constantly refer to her lips and the lack of colour in her lips. Please again remember that lips are not just those on the face but can also be vaginal lips and the fact that perhaps she's lost colour there would imply not only that she's very, very unwell and she's, um, she's losing blood somewhere, but it's the idea also that she is not even strong enough to participate in the act of sex. So blood, the symbol of blood is again at the forefront of this chapter. The idea that blood is so important. It's life blood. Without blood, we have no life. So again, blood as in fluid, blood as in bloodline. And now we're looking at life blood, the idea that Life blood is not necessarily the fluid, but it's the sense of being alive. Okay, so interestingly, uh, one of the earliest accounts of blood and how it circulates around the body was posed by an Arabic surgeon in 1260, which was, in fact, more than 200 years before William Harvey. Uh, his tre uh, treatise on how blood circulated around the body, which was written in 1628. So that's William Harvey, after which the hospital in Ashford is named. Okay, the first human blood transfusion was performed uh, in 1667 in Paris in June of 1667. And the chap who did this was Jean Baptiste de Nice. Obviously, there were some issues with this, and it was very dangerous because they were unaware at this point that there are different blood types. And if blood types are different, a transfusion can be deadly. So there were a number of fatal reactions to blood transfusions, which led to a banning um, of this practice in both England and France at the time. So the first successful transfusion um, took place in 1818. So clearly um, Lucy needs blood and that's what Van Helsing is saying. She she lacks blood, she lacks her life blood, she needs a transfusion and the response is, she, he says there must be a transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? And Seward says, I am younger and stronger professor. It must be be me. So note the use of the verbal auxiliary must, implying insistence and obligation. Obviously Van Helsing is a very astute man and he says to Seward, look, I've been reading your letters. I can read between the lines. I realise how you feel about Lucy. Perhaps you are not the best donor. We need someone of stalwart proportions who, and recognised the strong young manhood. So, as soon, luckily, amazingly, by some massive coincidence, Arthur appears on the scene. Dun, da, 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 Superman to save the day. 
And when Van Helsing looks at him, he says he is a man of stalwart proportions um, and he's young and he's manhood. All right, whenever they again refer to manhood, please, it, it certainly you can read into the fact that it could be a, dub a double entendre. OK, so he's a strong, strapping lad and he will make a great donor. And what does Van Halsing? He turns around to him and says, you've come just in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. Now, please remember the describing him as a lover in the 1800s does not mean they were ex uh, uh, participating in a love affair and they were sexually active. It meant, if, for example, if you are a lover of chocolate, it meant you love chocolate. So Arthur is a lover of Lucy, meaning he loves Lucy. OK, then Van Helsing says, good show you here. She is bad, very, very bad. OK, uh, just to highlight that the implication here is twofold. He is clearly not um, a first language speaker, because, again, we can see by the construction of his sentence, although he is also stressed at the time because of the situation going on. But also what he says is ambiguous, because the adjective bad here is, and in fact, we do this um, regularly um, in modern standard English, is we talk about when somebody says, how are you, say, I'm good. Now, good and bad refers to behavior rather than state of being. So what you sh we should say is if we should say, I'm well, but we turn, often say, I'm good, thank you. So when by saying she's bad, he is implying she's unwell, but what he's saying is that she's badly behaved, she's naughty. Okay, again, she has been naughty. So that is, is ironic as well. What can I do? Asked Arthur hoarsely. OK, again, he, we can see how stressed he is by the adverb um, to describe the way he speaks. Tell me and I shall do it. My life is hers and I would give the last drop of my blood in my body for her. So this chapter, the main focus, as I've said, is blood, but it is even more narrowed now by focusing not just on blood, but on blood transfusions. And of course, Stoker is now playing on the idea of a lover's lifeblood, the idea that you know we live uh, somebody's love uh, can be your lifeblood. Obviously, not literally. So again, the the thing is, I would give the last drop drop of blood in my body for her, as Arthur says. Um, Perhaps if we look at the situation, Lucy has done a similar thing, and it's looking at maybe a perversion of this idea of lifeblood, because Lucy's done a similar thing by giving her blood to her demon lover, the vampire. Uh, similarly, Seawood gives his blood to his beloved Lucy, because remember, he, lo he still loves Lucy. Only a few, a few days ago, he asked her to marry him. Um, and finally, in the future chapters, we'll see Van Helsing will also tr um, uh, donate her, his blood to her, his lifeblood. And he does that because he comes to love Lucy as a daughter. OK, so it's again the idea of love and what are we prepared to sacrifice for the people we love? Um, please note that every time we talk about um, the blood here, uh, when we, so we have... Um, Arthur, then we have Seaward, then we have Quincy Morris, all donating blood. Um, he he and, and and he's he says, well, we're getting this blood from these strong, these powerful, virile young men, and yet Lucy doesn't seem to make any improvement or any lasting improvement. And remember, every time she seems to have a relapse, the relapse is exponentially worse. So he says, you are a man and it is a man that we want. So again, we've got the Victorian stereotype of men are coming in to save a damsel in distress. Men are strong, whereas women are weak. So a man would be able to stand, uh, would be able to cope with a blood transfusion. Um, the fact that there are no women around other than Mrs. Weston may have some bearing on the situation. But it's the idea that a good, strapping, strong man um, has come. So clearly Van Helsing is aware of the physical toll that blood transfusions take 
on the body and they do hence why if you do donate blood you are obviously given told to rest afterwards you're only supposed to give a pint at a time and you're given uh, juice and biscuits afterwards but the word blood um, the noun blood is used regularly throughout this chapter okay um Arthur still care, uh, Arthur continues by saying, if you only knew how gladly I would die for her, you would understand. So this is what we mean by lifeblood. The preparation, not necessarily to give blood physically, but the idea of what a loved one will do for another loved one. So what are you prepared to do for the people you love? So, but on a, on a, a, a more literal level, the blood transfusion to save Lucy's life is going to form direct connect connection between all the main characters. Remember, blood has a metaphorical con connotation, again, in this um, novel and is the heart of the story, but also donating blood is um, you are giving, literally you are giving a part of yourself to another person. And that's why people get quite funny about it. It's a bit like organ donation some people believe that um by donating blood you will actually give part of your soul to another person and um, there have been lots of obviously movies and things all about uh, this kind of idea i remember one as a, a, a youngster which my brother forced me to watch i, I don't think i'll ever forgive him for this uh, about a, a, a very violent murderer who was on death row and he was killed and there was a horrific accident just after he um, was uh, put to death and so they farmed out his body parts and his organs and used them to help people in the accident and somebody got his arm and somebody got his leg and somebody got his heart and liver etc and after a few weeks these characters who got different parts of the body started to behave those parts of the body started to behave in a vicious murdery kind of way so the woman who got the arm she kept wanting to stab people etc etc now obviously there is no um, truth to this it is it was it's simply a, a supernatural gothic kind of theme but that's often what people believe that you will take on traits and you are giving something of yourself literally to another person so it is quite a, a sense of intimacy associated with this and we will come back and look at that in um a bit more detail later so arthur who's the first donor is we obviously know is lucy's fiance and he has aristocratic blood okay um so in the sentence he's so young and strong and of blood so pure that we need not defibrinate it the adjective pure here is not only referring to the physical nature of his blood and that he's not taking drugs, etc., etc., but um, the idea that he is an aristocrat. So his bloodline is pure. Because his blood is pure, it does not need to be changed or defibrinated. So unlike um, Dracula, who is this despotic foreign aristocrat arthur is a noble english gentleman so again i remind you of how we explored the accent the idea of a gentleman and what a, a traditional english gentleman stands for uh, way back in chapter one chapter two and chapter three um notice that the second donor which is dr seawood he has a slightly lower social status than arthur does to defibrinate, so what does that mean? Miss, you've been going on about defibrinating, I haven't got a clue. Well, a fibrin is a protein compound that is found in blood and it is a clotting agent. It's, uh, it's used to remove blood clots, so it's an anti-clotting agent. So you put it in uh, and therefore it would stop the, the blood from clotting within uh, the, oh, the little transfusion bags. Okay, in 1873, Sir Thomas Smith, he worked at St. Bart's Hospital in London, he successfully managed to defibrinate blood. Okay, so that was a great breakthrough. Um, another breakthrough in 1901, Carl Landsteiner described 
the fact that we had three different blood types. He identified type A, type B, and type O. And in 1902, a year later, um, Alfred uh, von, de, von Cast de Castello and Adriano Sterli found the fourth type, AB. Okay. Um, so they now started in, in 1901 and 1902 started to realize that we have different blood types. And Landsteiner argued that his work was really, really essential to the blood transfusion practice. But sadly, his ideas were ignored for over a decade. Think of how many lives could have been saved. But it's OK because we have Arthur. Arthur, a strong man, although the loss of blood was telling on Arthur, strong man as he was. Um, so I'm not sure at this point if they realized how much blood they could take. Um, but yes, it certainly has an impact on Arthur physically and emotionally. Okay. Right. He was going to give her a kiss, Lucy a kiss, adjusts the pillow and the scarf around her neck or the band around her neck is moved and we see this red mark on her throat. Please note at no point does Stoker explicitly state where this mark is from, but the reader assumes that Lucy's decline in health is um, linked to the, the, the changing colour of the mark on her throat um, and we know that the throat, the mark on the throat is a result of the vampire's repeated blood sucking. But again, Stoker doesn't tell us this. We, the reader, in, um, infer this. Uh, so when Seward asks, um, or Van Helsing says, what do you make of, to Seward, what do you make of the mark on her throat? He says, I have not examined it yet. And he said there was no sign of disease, but the edges were white and worn looking as if by some trituration. Trituration is a medical term for the viscous mixing of liquid or solids to produce a new substance. So let me try and think. It would be a bit like um, putting in flour and milk and eggs when you're making a cake and creating a batter. So it would be taking these three things, putting them together and combining one thing. Um, or maybe it's a bit like stirring your coffee to dissolve sugar. Okay, so that's that's what it means. Right. Van Helsing informs, obviously, um, Jonathan that he's going to have to look after Lucy. Um, and that he will not be able to sleep all night. He does not explain why he will not be able to, but he tells him he won't be. So, again, the implied meaning we put two and two together because we know that Dracula, based on what Jonathan has said, is only active at night. So, um, he says, right, later on we can sleep. Um, I'm going to... So, so, Van Helsing says he's off to... To Amsterdam and then when he gets back they'll be able to begin and Seward says begin what and he, um, Van Helsing says we shall see so again the frustration the building of tension for the reader because we know that he has um, knowledge that he is not sharing he's maybe being discreet maybe there are other reasons but again it creates a sense of mystery and suspense um, and we, the reader, are becoming tense and frustrated. So Van Helsing's return to Amsterdam connects him with a world of learning and esoteric knowledge, because, of course, in Europe, there were, you know, was great learning going on at the time. Um, and it also serves to remind us that he is not an Englishman. So remember, we don't just have Englishmen. It's the idea that we have an American. We have someone from Transylvania. Um, we have a Dutchman. Again, although um, the arrival of Dracula is likely to cause chaos and destruction to Victorian society, it is not just limited to Victorian society. It's the idea that he could affect the whole world. Um, his statement, we shall see, also suggests that he has some mysterious knowledge. Obviously, he's got a background in this that we want to know a bit more about. And he comes across with his sayings, his statements, uh, you know, for example, like talking about failure and success. He comes across as like a, a wise man 
or a sage uh, i suppose a bit like merlin and arthur's Le arthur legends of arthur or gandalf and lord of the rings yes i made a lord of the rings um reference i know you're all in shock but there we go his actions however as we go through we so we keep being reminded that he is a learned man but some of his actions towards the end make us wonder because he seems more mystic towards the end than scientist he says to uh seaward remember she is your charge if you leave her and harm befall you shall not sleep easy hereafter so again we are reminded of how significant everything uh, all these actions are and how the what the ramifications could possibly be so seaward is speaking to lucy who is now afraid to go to sleep and when he asks why he says she says that sleep what um, is a presage of horror a presage is a, a an omen or a portent okay and again um one of the questions could very well be how does the the author create a sense of fear and this is an example we lucy doesn't know why she's scared she just knows that sleep the idea of sleep fills her with dread she's um and we can make links again between that and her dreams and we know what happens in her dreams stop it okay the 9th of september we have um another diary entry and it's clear that seaward has assumed responsibility for watching over lucy when we read through this this is a little bit ironic for for at least two reasons um firstly lucy is the one who prevents him from watching over her at night and secondly her happy thoughts of arthur she goes on about how much he loves arthur he's so wonderful follow her description of a physical presence that is warm about me and we're going to look at that in a little bit um so we've got this dramatic um irony because she won't let lucy won't let um see would look after her and we know that, that that's going to be a fatal mistake and we not then swap lucy's diary okay and she talks on the 9th of september about how she felt so happy because of sense of blood transfusion she's feeling a lot stronger and how she feels so much closer to arthur so again it's that idea of linking an intimacy created by the the, the trans blood transfusion and she says somehow arthur feels very close to me and then she says i seem to feel his presence warm about me now that's is that is that if it's a physical manifestation is that arthur or is that dracula so it's the hint of sexual energy it seems like the sexual energy is is bubbling it's close to the surface um and the way she speaks we the reader are certainly not surprised by the fact that she relapses okay we then uh, swap go to the 10th of september with seward's diary and he describes um what is happening and how uh she has declined in health how when van helsing comes back he's absolutely shocked by what he sees she's actually even her lips are white the gums seem to have shrunken back from the teeth it was like a corpse so again her relapse is is even worse exponentially worse than it was previously um he reckons they need another blood transfusion and he says though um he says i fear that with growing strength she may wake and that could make a danger so clearly van helsing knows more than he's saying he, he's worried that if they do give her blood and she wakes up what wakes up is going to be very dangerous and um he then talks um uh, seaward then talks about he says no man knows till he experiences it what it is like what it is to feel his own life blood drawn away into the veins of the woman he loves so seaward is very eager um and he keeps going on about donating blood and he says 
I remonstrated you took a great deal more from art. So the impression is that he is jealous because he took a lot of blood from Arthur, but he hasn't taken blood from Seward. And clearly Seward is also beginning to realise the... Um, ramifications and the the intimacy created and he cannot have intimacy with Lucy in any other way because remember she has rejected him and is a rejected suitor and this is the only way of having intimacy without um you know perhaps breaking social norms okay Van is well we're gonna have to Take your blood, but do not say anything to him. No word to him. Him is Arthur. It would at once frighten him and then jealous him too. There must be none. Okay, so again, we are reminded of the idea or the discretion that Van Helsing um, shows. So, for the first transfusion, Van Helsing insisted it must be Arthur, but now he's going to allow John to donate. Why? Because he has to, because they cannot take blood from Arthur again so quickly. Okay, again, if you know, you cannot donate blood if you've donated in the last month. So they said it takes a month to rebuild from, uh, rebuild the blood cells from the donation. So the question of discretion is raised because our, um, Van Helsing fears Arthur will be jealous or frightened if he finds out that his, another man has given blood to his fiance. Okay. So the idea, again, it's about mixing bodily fluids, okay, uh, again, which mimics the sex act, because without protection of a condom, um, sex is, you, you do end up mixing bodily fluids from saliva to everything else. So Van Helsing is clearly aware of this intimacy, and he actually raise he's the first to raise it he's the first to speak about it again this highlights that he is not a traditional english gentleman who doesn't talk about these things he actually raises the situation as a problem um it also has been suggested by some critics so when it talks about there must be none he is implying that then arthur must not be frightened or jealous because if he has to donate blood again, blood again, it will be tainted by his fear and his jealousy. And this is a link back to the four human humours, which was obviously a very big deal in uh, medieval uh, and Renaissance uh, times when they talked about there were four humours. We Our bodies were made up predominantly of one of the four black bile. Um, if you if you had predominantly black bile, you were melancholic and depressed. If you were pro uh, predominantly phlegm, you were apathetic. If you were predominantly yellow bile, you were aggressive. And if you were predominantly blood, you'd be sanguine or optimistic and positive. So the ideal was to kind of have a balance between these four. So the, the, the suggestion, as some critics have put forward, is that if blood is tainted by jealousy or fear, it will not be any good. Seward donates blood to Lucy, okay, and Mrs. West, Aunt Lucy's so much better. She's happier, she's up, she's about, she's really uh, looking a lot better. And Mrs. Weston thanks Seward and says, oh, right, bless you, thank you for donating blood. You'll now want a wife to nurse you. Okay, so um, again, the stereotypical role of the Victorian woman, that is what you do. Uh, however, as she spoke, Lucy turned crimson. So again, we are reminded, and this is important, we are reminded that Lucy could have been that wife who would have looked after him. Um, we then skip to the 11th of September. And he says, this afternoon I went over to Hillingham. Hillingham, again, reminder, is the name of the house that Lucy, the Westerners, have in London. And he brings a whole lot of flowers, garlic flowers. So again, he clearly has had some, Van Helsing has had some background or some history with this because he knows that using garlic is a good way to ward off vampires. 
and he brings in all of this and it doesn't smell great and the comparison is it smells so like the waters of the Lethe and of that fountain of youth that the conquistador sought for in the Floridas. So the River Lethe is also kind of known as the River of Unmindfulness or, for, pardon me, hiccups, forgetfulness. It is believed to have flowed um, around the cave of Hypnos and through the underworld where everyone who drank from it um, experienced complete forgetfulness. So this is all in uh, Greek mythology. Uh, and Lethe is also the name of the Greek god of forgetfulness and oblivion. Okay, so if we recall back to um, Seaward and the, coral, uh, the chloral hydrate incident um, in chapter 8, uh, if he was, he talks about Morpheus, but he could have also talked about Lethe and the idea of um, chloral hydrate bringing about forgetfulness and oblivion. Um, so the garlic smells foul. Um, the other thing compares to the fountain of youth that the conquistador sought. So conquistador is the word, is the Portuguese word for conqueror. And in this particular reference, it the conqueror is a, a Spanish chap called Juan Ponce de Leon, who lived from 1474 to 1521. He was a great Spanish explorer and he led the first known not saying it's the first one, but the first recorded expedition to La Florida, which became Florida, as we know in America, in the States. He was apparently, his trip was all to find the Fountain of Youth. And again, in terms of the Fountain of Youth, obviously, when we drink from the Fountain of Youth, we will have eternal youth, a bit, I suppose, like the Philosopher's Stone in Harry Potter. Yay me, making another link. Um... Lucy says, thank you ever so much, but are you joking? Is this a joke? These are nothing but common garlic. And for the first time, we see Van Helsing kind of lose it, and he gets angry, and he responds with, no trifling with me. I never jest. Why? Because it emphasizes the seriousness of the situation. And the reader is growing increasingly frustrated because we are thinking for goodness sake if you just tell him or tell them what you were doing maybe um, they will work with you instead of against you and again it's the whole idea that we're creating opportunities for Lucy's mother to remove the garlic in the next chapter so um, we leave off with this um, and the statement that Van Helsing says, tonight I can sleep in peace. Uh, and it's because he has such belief in.